Divine Truth Assistance Group. These group assistance sessions are about putting principles of divine truth into action. This discussion is part of the 2014 Australia Group 2 series. Jesus gives an introduction to understanding self. Filmed on the 29th of July 2014 in Monterey, New South Wales, Australia. All right, well now um, we've got a lot of really good material to share with you. It's going to be shared with you very quickly. Um, and by the way, it's quickly because there's so much of it. Um, and it was quickly last week as well. All of this, remember, all this material is on PowerPoint presentations that are already on the net. We put them on the net last week. And they are also going to be outlines that are already on the net. So. Um, Probably the best thing to do here, you can take notes if you wish, but you're going to find it difficult to keep up if you do that. So my suggestion is to engage, try to stay engaged, and note down the things that are pertinent to your, to, to what you feel is pertinent to you, if, if you're going to note down anything. Remember, if there's anything that's missed out, you will have an opportunity to have a look at the outlines, download them for yourself, and also to go through these exact PowerPoint presentations yourself if you want to. On, on your own, at your own time. As uh, we said to you earlier, today is going to be about understanding yourself. Now, quite often I'm asked what, why people feel like, or why I feel people are stagnant. Quite often that's what I'm asked. So, what are my observations? What I found is that people who are stagnant do not understand themselves. They don't understand how they're made. They don't understand how the soul's created. They don't understand that actually you have to feel an emotion before you're going to have any real progress. They just don't understand themselves and how they're, they're, they work. They don't understand the fragmentation that's occurred to themselves. And because of all of those things, uh, they find themselves quite stagnant. They don't even want to know God a lot of the time. They don't understand or want to know God. They, in fact, most people, if you, and if you're honest with yourselves, when you were first attracted to divine truth, how many of you were first attracted because you wanted to know God? Like, it's a fairly rare thing for most people, right? What, how many of you were first attracted because you wanted to know God? Just put up your hand, a few. How many of you were first attracted because you wanted to do some self-improvement, some kind of growth in love? See, see a lot more, right? So, so the aspect of wanting to know God is usually not the first thing that attracts us to divine truth. We want to come face, we don't really want to come face to face with the truth about ourselves. That is a big problem. We don't want to become fa come face to face with it. We don't want to look in the mirror and see ourselves as God sees us. Right? What else? Those who are stagnant do do the following things. They want to ignore their true condition. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> they want to ignore God. They want to ignore feeling and experiencing their own painful emotions. That's a big one, right? They want to ignore feeling and experiencing their own painful emotions. And they want to ignore the damage they do to other people and themselves. All right? So, understanding ourselves and understanding what God created us to be are going to be sort of key parts of our development, our key parts of our building and maintaining and growing infinitely in a relationship with God. So how you are made, understanding yourself and how you're made is essential to your growth. Now recently we've put on to YouTube a whole series of stuff about the human soul, discussions about the human soul. If you haven't already listened to those discussions and watched them, my suggestion is you do so, because it's a lot about how the soul functions, how it works, how emotions flow in and out, how belief systems are retained in your soul. All of those things are discussed in those discussions. My suggestion to you, if you haven't already looked at those discussions, is to go over those discussions. Without understanding yourself, you can't grow, you can't change, you can't engage the real process of growth. So 
You need to, we need to understand ourselves. It's critical to our progress. We must understand that we are a soul. So I keep drawing this diagram, and you've seen it so many times now, it's like, you know, it's, you're probably having dreams about it, and it's probably that bad, where you've got a soul, or if, if we remember drawing it correctly, we are one half of a soul connected to a body, two bodies, spirit body and a material body. You've seen that many times, right? Physical body, soul. Many of you are still focused on the development of your physical and spiritual bodies and you are completely ignoring your soul. This is a problem if you're going to develop. You need to understand that you're a soul. So we need to understand the emotions and feelings that are a part of these parts or fragmented parts of ourselves that are, belong to our soul. They're not our mind, they're not our physical body's brain, they're not our spirit body's mind. They are things that occur inside of our sensory apparatus that is the soul, the real you. And we need to understand it. We need to know how it functions and works so that we know how to clear away the damage that's been done to it. We need to know these things. So we have previously introduced you to this concept of the three selves, have we not? Do you remember what they are? So we're talking now about your half of the soul, broken, if you like, into three fractures. You remember what they are? If we come down to Nikki at the front. Uh, Nikki, and it's your real self. So your real self. And next to you, Pete, Peter. Da damaged self. The damaged self, yes, or the, you could call it the hurt self. Yeah, so let's, let's use that term for today, hurt self. So this is the real self. Yep. And the third one? In the facade. The facade. Okay. Now you've seen that being, you've had that introduced to you as a concept, right? These are not what I would call different parts of myself or different, or, or I would call them, it's all one self. You are one self. There's no like, this part of yourself, that part of yourself. But these are fragmentations that have occurred due to specific emotional conditions that have occurred during your life. So the fragmentation that's occurred is the undamaged self that God created. There's the damaged or hurt self that you and your environment created. Now, how did you create it? And how did your environment create it? Can you remember? How does your environment create the hurt? How does that happen? Any, anyone want to stab that? That let's come down to Lawling. Lawleen, um, through my parents and those involved in my, in my childhood. Good. Now, how did you add to it? By my own choices and will. Correct. So we need to understand the hurts, not just what our environment, what our parents did, but it also is our choices. And in fact, to be frank with you, the large majority of the hurt that exists inside of you is actually due to our choices. Right? And the older we get, the worse that gets. Right. Okay, so then we come to the facade. That, notice who created your facade? If we go to Dennis. We did. We did, and? By our choices. By our choices, but, but hang on a sec. There was also others who also did it. Right? So it's not just you. It's also other people who've created it. We'll go into that as we discuss these three parts or three fractures of our one self. All right. So we're talking about three selves from an emotional soul-based perspective. We're not talking about your intellect here. So this is, this is emotion. So what I'm going to do is focus you on the emotional feelings that belong to these different fractures of yourself. Does that make sense? So let's have a look at some of these things. It's a single self, and I can't emphasise this enough. 
It's a single self fragmented by the denial of the real hurt and facade emotions. Right? So, so you're not three things in one. Right, aside from having a physical body, spirit body, you are, we're talking now just about your soul. Your soul is one self fragmented into parts because of the suppression and denial of emotion. That's why it's happened. Uh, and this happened right from the moment of conception. Emotion began to be suppressed from that moment onwards. So the question now becomes, what is the real self? How do we define the real self? So let's look at some of the definitions of the real self. So, the personality of my real self is created by God. The expression of my real self is controlled by myself alone. The development of my real self is controlled by myself. Now, what questions do you have about that so far? Yep, Sue? I feel that I've got no idea who my real self is. I, I agree. Most, yeah. most people have no idea who their real self yeah. is, and we'll talk about that in a minute as to yeah. why that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. But it is controlled by you alone. That's scary thought, isn't it? I've got no idea where my real self is, but it's all controlled by my real self. God, where, what trouble am I in already, right? Yeah, this is how it is for most of us. My real self has the ability to grow and change. And actually, with God's love, has the ability to transform into a different being than it was originally created. This, this is a remarkable thing about your soul. It's just a, like every, everything I've ever found out about the human soul, and I've spent a lot of time studying the human soul in my life, I've just been blown away by its complex design that, that is absolutely incredible for future, it, it, like it enables future everlasting infinite expansion. Like it's the only thing that does that in the entire universe, right? So I'm talking inside the universe God created, the human soul is the only thing that infinitely can, has, has the potential for expansion. Right? Pretty amazing design. It's just, there is so many things I'd like to say about your real self, but we're not going to get to cover it today. There's a lot of things to learn here. Remember here, we're trying to educate you about love. This is the education you didn't get, right? So remember we're learning about these things. So at my conception, my real self has not been hurt and did not play facades. Now, of course, shortly after conception, it was hurt and began to play the exact same facades that the parents played. All right? So this is the problem. But the real self is without those things in its pure state. Now, I want to focus your attention on a few things here. Firstly, you can see that the real self, the development of it, is controlled by myself. This is a very important thing to understand. You are, right at this state, right at this moment, you are controlling your own development. No, there's no magical thing outside of you that controls your development. You are it. You're the thing that determines where you go from here. Very important under, that you understand that. Right? And what we need to do is see what we're developing before we can actually talk about that more. So let's look at some of that. Now, we can call our real self God's child, which is exactly what we are. That is who you are, God's child. I am God's child. We're all God's children. In fact, we're all half of one of God's children. And the other half is somewhere out there in the universe 
as well. Okay, so what does this emotional self that's real feel like? What kind of qualities does it have from an emotional perspective? You follow? This is what we want to look at. It's sensitive, aware, perceptive, and insightful. This is your real self. It was created to have this ability, instinctually. Your real self instinctually is expressive, animated, communicative, open, and unrestrained. That's your real self. It was created to instinctually be that way. So there are, you could say the personality traits and the instincts that your soul has are to be this way. So we're already a long way away from that, right? For most of us, but that's what we... It's honest, truthful, sincere, frank, candid, blunt, and transparent. Right? That's part of your real self. And you think about, in your day-to-day -day life, how often are you candid, blunt, and transparent? Uh, for the majority of us, we're, we're definitely not candid, and we're certainly not blunt. <laughs> and when it comes to transparency, no, we're, as, we're black, we're not even opaque <laughs> for many of us. Nobody even knows what's going on inside of most of us, right? It's adventurous, courageous, daring, bold, creative, brave, and audacious. They're lovely words, aren't they? Describing the real self. Yep. Is curious, inquisitive, questioning, probing, searching and inquiring. Really lovely qualities too, those. In fact, those qualities, part of your instinctual nature. Every, by, by the way, all of you have these qualities. All of you. This is not a personality thing. This is what God has designed every, in every single soul. Uh, if, if God had put some of these qualities in me and not in you, then wouldn't that be unfair? Uh, these are instinctual qualities of the real self. Undeveloped, untrained, but there, present. And you just look at that one, the curious, inquisitive, questioning, probing, that's going to be a key part of your development, isn't it? You can see your child already engaging that, can't you? The child engaging that in their learning process, key part of their development. Right? When you get all like, like, you feel like you already know everything and, and all that, a long way away from that. Long way away. It's emotional, feeling, sensing, sensual. All right? So you know when you say to yourself, I'm just not as emotional as the average person. Sorry. All of you have been created with the same capacity to feel emotion. Every single one of you. And there's no difference in scale. You all have the same capacity to feel emotion. You're all feeling emotion differently now because of what's happened to you. But you all have the same capacity. Now, it can develop to become... Now, this is very different than having instinctual qualities now. This is going to be dependent upon what you choose to do with these instinctual qualities. Does that make sense? It can develop to become wise, intelligent, clever, gifted and logical. It can develop to become sensible, practical, responsible, accountable, dependable and rational. So you know how the logical song from Supertramp goes, you know, when I was young, it seemed that life was so... Whatever, I can't remember all the words. <laughs> you don't need to look it up either. But remember, there's a thing, when, I, when it, they made me a way to become sensible, see, see I, being sensible is a natural quality of the soul you can develop. You can be sensible. It's not, it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. <laughs> it's a good thing. And you need to be accountable you need to be dependable, practical, responsible. These are things that you need to develop in yourself. But they are developed. They're not there automatically. And the most important, can develop to become loving, 
caring, kind, gentle, considerate and compassionate. Love is not a given to the soul, it is a potential developed quality. Because there's plenty of people who do not have it developed, right? Yep. See, see this new age concept that, oh, there's a spark of love in everyone. I, I, I don't know if I can agree with that. Right? Initially, you're created like a container. You, you are the structure of your soul, and it has the potential to become loving and kind and considerate and compassionate, but it also has the potential to become very evil, like just as much potential to, do go, to do go that direction. And it depends on the choices, the will, the way the will is used. Thanks, Linda. <coughs> Uh, um, Linda, so if w this is, thank you so much, this is such a wonderful tool because I'm feeling that if I use this information now to uncover my real self, if I just focus on how sensitive am I, how aware am I, how perceptive am I yep. or not, yep. then I, I can really look and see how far or how close I am to discovering my real self, can't I? Um, can I just, yes, all of that's true with the exception of one word. You keep okay. using the term discovering. Oh, okay. Now, the term <coughs> discovering implies that there's a whole it, heap of things unknown. that are already there. Okay. And not all of these things are already there. No. Some of them have to be developed. Yes. So, so it's not just about discovering your true self, which is you know, the instinctual parts or the parts of your personality and nature that God created. But there's also this aspect, and, and by the way, I'm going to talk more about this aspect, of developing certain parts of you. And, and to be honest with you, the developmental side of the soul is far greater in its potential than the stuff that's already there. So is that what we should really focus on, looking at the bits that we need to develop and in, in activating our will to develop that? I would focus on both. Firstly, rediscovering, you've used the term rediscovering the parts that instinctually are there that yeah. you've suppressed yeah. or your environment has suppressed. Yeah. Or, but, but, and more importantly, once you've discovered all those, use those things to develop your soul Yes. Further. Because remember, your soul has an infinite capacity of expansion if it receives God's love. Mm. So you now have the prospect of developing your soul. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they really go hand in hand, don't yes. they? They need to be, we need to look at them, whatever is the right word, synergistically or we however do. we do it. Yeah. We do. Yeah. So you, 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 this is not about. See, for many of you, you, you say, oh, I want to discover the love that's inside of me. For many of you, there's no love inside of you. So good luck with that. You're never going to discover it. Mm. You're going to have to develop it. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? There's a difference between discovering something that's already there and developing something that is something that you're going to have to work on or act upon through your choice of your will mm. to develop. Yep. Okay. So, of course, your real emotional self has its will. How you use it, of course, is dependent upon your development. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Is there any other questions you'd like to ask about that? Isn't it good to write down the feelings? Could you start connecting? Oh, yes. You, you know that, you know, when you first discovered divine truth for many of you, how did you feel? It wasn't, it, wasn't it this one? Curious, inquisitive, questioning, probing? Like, there was that, whoa, oh, I want to know more that enthusiasm, that's a very childlike feeling, isn't it? Well, that's a part of that real self, that feeling. And then we start getting worried. You notice that? You start, oh, I'm starting to worry about what I'm discovering now. You know, what, what's now, where, where's worry in this? Nowhere. No, nowhere. Well, that's some other part of yourself now, it's sort of an operation, right? There's worry, worry's not there. So maybe if we come down here, and who is it over here? Enter. Uh, Phoebe, um, so with our passions and desires, I had an idea that it was something that God, God's given us all a unique 
passion or way of God's given you the potential to develop your passions and desires. Okay. And so, some of your personality will definitely affect how or what you will passionately or desire, desire. But actually, you can desire many things that now you currently don't desire. In other words, you can develop desire for things. Yeah. So we have such a, a bigger scope maybe than what I could ever have conceived. You have a much bigger scope. You have a yeah. universal scope. God gave you a universal playground to learn about uh, so many different things. And our personality will influence how we express Correct. our Correct. It will influence how you develop this desire and it will also do influence the first things initially that you're interested in. Yeah. But your personality will have an influence on those things. But, but your personality doesn't determine your desires or your passions because they are developed qualities. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, so in other words, you can develop new desires that you never had before. Yeah. You think about it as you're growing, isn't that the case? Like, like if you think about the average development of the average child, you know, when it's three, four, five years old, it's, it's not thinking about growing, uh, growing up, unless it's been damaged already, it's not thinking about growing up and having children or growing up and having a relationship, usually at that stage, right? But, but by the time it gets to puberty, another desire starts developing, right? A new one of, oh, I'd like to have relationships now. I'd like to... You know, have, to discover what it's like to be in a partnership with the other half of myself. This is a, it's a potential in your soul, but it's something you can develop. Does that make sense? So God's created all these potentials in your real self, which you can choose to develop or choose to ignore. Right? Most of us choose to ignore most of it, unfortunately. But we've got the potential to develop any of these things. You also have the potential to develop things negatively, right, as well. So, so you can develop to become unwise, totally, totally stupid, right? You can do that too, right? Because development means that you've got the choice to go in either direction. Right? This, is the, this is the choice of our will. Unfortunately for many of us, it's not the choice of, it hasn't been the choice of our will, it's been the choice of somebody else forcing their will upon us, which we'll talk about in a minute. Does that make sense? Is there any other questions? There was Anto. Hi, Anto. Yeah, you answered just the first part of it. Um, the second part is, with the will, is that a combination of these elements that assists you to develop? That quality of will? Or? No, the, the will, God's given you free will, which is a condition like where you're allowed to make your own choices, but the development of your will itself is a different quality which you can either develop or ignore. Many of us have ignored it, many of us have tried to give it away, but it's all there, it's all there that can, and it can be developed further. Does that make sense? If it couldn't be developed, Mary wouldn't have talked about strengthening your will, she would have said, she would have called it discovering your will. <laughs> Does that make sense? But she used the term strengthening your will because it's a quality you can strengthen and develop. Yep. Just like all other aspects of your soul. Isn't it amazing? Like it just gives you this like, oh, okay, that means I can find out a whole heap of new things and then develop those too. Yeah. And, and even more importantly, you can start to get God's love and then a whole new set of potentials become open to you that you can then choose to develop. Just, that's just an amazing concept. Uh, I don't know what God was doing that day that he dreamed that one up, but yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> uh, like I just think about that and I go, <laughs> you know, that, that, what God has done with the human soul is beyond even the most advanced being at this stage in the universe to understand. That's how, how amazing the human soul is. If we, if we're... Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, she's writing there. <laughs> um, this is something I've really misunderstood, like... Um, this, this bit here? No, about... Like, I really thought that your desires and passions were something that was given to you as part of your personality. So what you're saying is that you can develop a desire or passion for anything. 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. God placed in each of you a unique personality. And in fact, there is a part of yourself which is actually a unique part of God's personality that God chose to design within you. So in other words, each of you have a unique part of God's infinite personality built into you as a part of your personality. But that's not your desires and passions. That's your personality. Your desires and passions are completely uh, available for you to develop. So... So, what's the question? Where do they come from then? Like, I, I'm really struggling to find my passions and desires because yeah. I'm still... So well, we'll important. talk about why that's the case because it's quite easy to discover your passions and desires once you realise you're allowed to have any one of them you want. <laughs> you start listing all the things you'd like to do then, right? <laughs> but, but, see, for most of us, we, we think we're trying to discover what God put in us. But, but no... We don't need to discover what God put in us. We need to use what God put in us instinctually as a part of our personality and nature to enjoy and discover life and use life to actually discover all these potentials that we have. Does that mean like in your 2,000 years of existence, mm -hmm. have you had a passion and desire for everything then really? Y yes. Don't, doesn't it appear that way? <laughs> like... You start talking to me about the environment, I can go on for days. Right? You start talking to me about how things are made, I go on for days. You can talk to me about the human body, I can go on for days. I'm interested in everything. I don't know about you, but I, I, I have a lot of very varied interests. <laughs> All right? And I'm passionate about each one because a, a normal part of the soul is adventurous, courageous, daring, bold, creative, brave, audacious. Because huh? I'm interested and curious about so many things and I thought it was a failing because I couldn't narrow it down to something that... Definitely not a failing. Definitely not a failing. As you develop, you'll find your interest will grow and continue to grow in more and more things. Like, like once we are back to our normal condition, right, you'll see how many interests we have. And you'll go, like, you'll be amazed at how many things there are to be interested in. Yeah. Thanks. Yep, Natalie, um, and then Linda. I'd just like you to repeat to me, you just said that God has put a little bit of his personality in every one of his children. Yeah. Does anyone have the same quality twice? <laughs> like well, that's... obviously, we all have a different spread of, the, of that natural personality, if you like. Okay. But, but now you're starting to get a bit ahead of yourselves. Because okay. okay. there's a lot more to discover here okay. before we can start okay. discussing the intricacies of it, right? Yeah. Uh, Linda. Uh, Linda. I'm just feeling super excited right now because I've Why just wouldn't you be? realised yeah. that... All of this information is also giving us a clue into God. And so if, because God's given us a little sharing with us, a little aspect of him or herself, and yep. so we can, yep. by looking at that, we can really learn to understand God and develop our relationship with God. It'll be so much easier, won't it? Yes. Yeah. God, is, God is infinitely sensitive, infinitely aware, infinitely perceptive and infinitely insightful. He's infinitely expressive, infinitely animated, infinitely communicative, infinitely open and infinitely unrestrained. God is infinitely honest, infinitely truthful. Do, I, do you start getting the picture? Like God is all of these things to an infinite degree. Right? But then... All the things we can develop, God is also infinitely wise, infinitely intelligent, infinitely clever. You see? And the, the things we can develop, we can develop, become infinitely sensible. Infinitely, God's all, already that. Infinitely sensible, infinitely practical, infinitely responsible. This is what God is like. This gives us a lot of knowledge about God as well, right? In terms of God's nature, God's qualities. Can you see why many of you have been finding it hard to communicate with God? Because you think God's there, some great big ogre sitting up there going at you and none of these things, right? Yeah, bit of a problem. 
we can develop to become the loving, caring, kind, gentle, but God is already infinitely loving, infinitely caring, infinitely kind. Many of you believe that you're more loving than God is. Many of you, when somebody gets cancer and you care for that person, you get angry at God and you say, why is God not caring for this person? Why does this person have cancer? And you don't understand, God, God's more infinitely loving than you are. This person has cancer for a very good reason. It's out of harmony with love. Right? These are things we need to understand, right? Don't, don't we? We come down to Daniel down in front. Hey, AJ, I'm just really curious about the unborn fetus. And, yep. and it's capable of expressing all of those it at is. the top there. All of those down to the, where the development starts. Yep. Straight after conception. Yep. Yeah, it's really amazing. <laughs> yeah, because it's the soul, it's not the child. See, when you think the undeveloped fetus, hang on a sec, let's get our concepts right for a moment. The undeveloped fetus is the physical and spiritual body undeveloped, but the soul is already there, it's already connected to those things. It's the soul that contains these things, right? So already it's, a, it's already in this place of curious, wanting to know what's going on in the world, wanting to... It's Just already trying to express feeling it through that developing body as well correct it starts to connect to the bodies in order to express its development yes and to discover new things so the bodies are just like tools that God's given you to interface with the physical and spiritual worlds before you hit the soul world if you like the, the union state so you could think of the entire physical universe Right, the Earth, the entire physical universe surrounding it, all of the stars, all of the galaxies, everything, that's the physical universe. That's for the physical body in order to interface to the, the universe. Does that make sense? And then there's this universe, let's draw it similarly but bigger, that's the spiritual universe, and the spirit body has been designed for half of the soul, this is half of the soul, interfacing with the, that part of the universe. Then once the soul reaches the union state, right, now your real life begins. Right? Because now you're back into a union state. You're now one soul. Now you start, you could call it the soul, I don't know what other terminology I can give it, but let's call it the soul world. The soul world now becomes your oyster. It becomes the thing that you use to discover the rest of your existence. When you get to that union state, 36th dimension, you're just a baby, first time back together, conscious that you're back together. Now you imagine, if you can infinitely grow and you reach that state, what do you think is the potential then? You've got no idea what the potential is then, right? So. We need to understand that the, the fetus, the physical body, and the spirit body, even as a baby, they're just bodies. You don't need them later when you amalgamate with the other half of your soul. And, and the world that these bodies experience, while they are amazing, they're nothing compared to what you will experience in a union state. Nothing. We need to, we need to get some grasp on ourselves right here. But, it's very hard, of course, to have a grasp on ourselves when, when we're just struggling with the other parts of ourselves. Yep. Kelly? Oh, you might have answered this before, but um, why then did we need to incarnate? Why did we go from being a soul, spiritual body, why yep. did we need to come into a physical body and experience this and not... Get well, to know ourselves and become aware of ourselves. There's the two halves, right? Yeah. One half incarnates and the other half incarnates. So the question is, why did the two halves in separately incarnate? Well, because they're unaware of themselves. They're unaware yeah. of their own masculine qualities, feminine qualities. They're unaware of their nature. They've got to discover all of these things. And God, says, and God said during the creation, you could say, God says, you know what? It's going to be an amazing process discovering everything. Right? Now, it's very unfortunate that most of us don't believe that anymore. You know, we want to know everything right now, right? Why? Because we're full of fear. 
the, a, person, a child doesn't want to know everything, it just wants to know the thing that's right in front of it right now. Right? We could still have that feeling, but we don't, because we're afraid. So now we're talking about other parts of ourselves, interfering with the development of our real self. But the reason why we incarnated is because we needed to become consciously aware, each half needs to become consciously aware of itself and its other half. How does it do that in an experiential way? By incarnating. That's how it does it. It goes through the process of incarnation. Remember, it's unaware of itself at this point. How does it gain an awareness of itself? By incarnating, connecting to two bodies that it can now experience the universes with, and now it goes through a process of discovery of itself and discovery of the universe, a discovery of God and discovery of anything that God's created. And so couldn't that happen without a physical body? Like, Well, it could. But, but so your question is, why did God make us with a physical body? Yeah, not just go stay because in the God, spiritual world and have babies and be in a spirit body. Well, true. That might have been that might have been a design that God come up with, but God just shows it this way. Okay. Right. So I can't say, you know, I haven't had a discussion with God that said, God, I reckon a better idea. <laughs> That'd be pretty arrogant, right? I reckon a better idea would be that you just made us for the spirit world instead. Yeah. And he'd say, and he'd say to me, what's the difference between that and what I've done? You still have babies, and you still do, you do all of these other things. Like, what's the difference? Sure. Like, and I, I'd sort of imagine that conversation going not very well anyway, <laughs> given the fact that I'm already being quite arrogant. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Gabriella. Uh, I wonder, is uh, our personality involved in both the, the part we could discover and the part we could develop? Of course. Yeah. Your personality is a part of what God has created and it will be involved in the development of everything from, there, from here on. It will. You will be a more and more grow, a, a growingly individual, unique person. That's what happens. But remember, there's two parts to you. There's you and the other half. So at this stage, most of you have complete lack of awareness of the other half and how to connect to them, right? So, so at this stage, you're just focusing on the development of yourself, thinking yourself is one soul, but you're only one half. But what do you think it's going to be like when you discover the other half? So like, there's a whole heap of things there that you'd like to know, right? And so you'll have to go through the process of discovering those if you want to develop that part of yourself. Does that make sense? Is everyone warm enough now? Should we turn off the heaters, do you think? Yeah, let's whack them off. And um, over this side, thanks. Oh, who, who was I at? Corny just did it. No, no, I, oh, no, I want Elvira on this side. And on this side, uh, Julie. So if we go, Elvira. Um, you said the word unique, and that's something that I've struggled with a lot too, is if as we develop and we all become more those things... Uh, yeah, be careful here, Vera. I'm not saying that these things at the top down to develop are unique to you because they are the same in every person. No, but say like if as we develop in love mm -hmm. um, and we, we start with those qualities and we connect to them and then we develop the other ones, mm -hmm. what makes, what's going to make us different to each other? Like our personality. See, these are not, this is not our personality. Yeah, I know, but even like when you think of all the billions of people, how yeah. can you be near? Like, I don't feel like... Isn't it an incredible I... thing? You're very different to what I am, right? Yeah, at this point, very different. But... Yeah. And we're going to remain so. But we'll be the same development in love at some point if you grow. But what are the things that are personality then that make a person, if it's not... See, see now what you're doing, you know what you're doing now? Dun -dun, bad, 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 bad yeah. thing to do. A mistake, I judge you completely for it. Um, no, no, I'm just joking. There's a, there's, this is where we go. You want to know your personality before you discover it. You want somebody to tell you it. Right? And I'm suggesting to you, no, you've got to give this up, Ilvera. 
You've got to give up this desire to know in advance something. You've got to go through the experience of discovering yourself. This is what you are terrified of doing. You don't want to discover yourself. You want to be told about yourself. And God's not going to do that. God's not going to do that for any of you. God created a system by which you discover yourself if you engage your real self. Right? So you need to engage these qualities which are in everyone to discover your real personality and nature. Right? Rather than have somebody tell you what it is. God doesn't want to tell you what it is. If God had wanted to tell you, I'm sure God would have written down a thing for you right at the time of conception, you know, all of a sudden magically, because God can do these things, right? God can make thing, matter appear from nothing. So God could have just write down, okay, Elvira's, Elvira's arrived, you know, she's been conceived. So mum and dad receive a document called Elvira. Right? And on that document are notes about all of the real personality that Elvira has so that Elvira doesn't have to go through the discovery of it herself. Now, that's what you want, but it's not what you're going to get. And you want that because you're afraid. That's the only reason. A child doesn't need that. A child doesn't want it. You want it now as an adult because you're afraid. And you're not recognising that your fear is now driving this question. Does that make sense? So let yourself discover yourself. Right. But now, before you can let yourself discover yourself, you're going to have to probably wade your way through the other two parts of yourself, unfortunately now. Because the other two parts of yourself have, uh, have not been created by God, but are now sort of wrappers on yourself that will have a big bearing on your life for a while. And by the way, this part of yourself is eternal, everlasting, the other two parts of yourself can be destroyed within a few years. When I say destroyed, you could say they could be unfragmented. They could be pulled back together within a few years. Now, most of your questions are about the other two selves. And see, that's not very logical either, if you think about it. Because this is the bit that lasts forever, and the other two selves are transient and don't last at all. And yet, most of our questions are about the other two selves. Isn't that interesting? It just shows us we don't really understand ourselves. Because most of our questions should really be, uh, and our engagements should be about these things. But, but unfortunately, it turns out often that they're not. Yeah. Uh, Rose. AJ, I have some confusion between emotion and feeling yep. and then feeling and sensing Can well um, emotion is different than sensory apparatus so if you think about the separate sensory apparatus of your body you've got you've got all you, you could say your, your five senses which we call five senses but there's also things like the senses of your nervous system for example the feelings of what happens inside and outside of your body they're all sensory in nature they are different than emotion. They can trigger emotion. But your soul has the ability to both sense and feel emotion. So sense in the sense of have sensory apparatus. And by the way, the five senses of the human body aren't the limit of the soul's sensory apparatus. Right? So ha for example, how can I feel your emotions? I don't touch you to do it. I don't, I don't, I don't even need to look at you to do it. So I don't need to hear your story to do it. I don't need to do any of those things to do it. So how do I do it? See, that's in a sense of the soul. That's the sensory apparatus of the soul. Does that make sense? Yeah. You can develop that. It's not automatically developed. It's something you have to choose to develop. Yeah. Do you follow me? Yes. So you said feeling emotion, and yet there's emotional and feeling up there. Can yeah, you differentiate yeah. between I'm using two? emotion and feelings As sort of interchangeably. Oh, but okay. sensing is a very different state. Yeah. Sensory, sensing is all to do with the sensory apparatus of the soul, which is reflected at different attenuations in the spirit and physical body. And do you know what I mean by different attenuations, like different no. levels of, of... Well, so you may, if I can just present that to you, 
you've got your half of the soul, right? And it's got all of these sensory apparatus by its, when it exists on its own, right? And then your spirit body gets some of those sensory apparatus because they can't be given to the physical body. The physical body is incapable of actually having the sensory apparatus that the spirit body has. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And the reason why God's done it this way is quite easy to see if you think about it. If you were given all of the soul's senses at the moment of conception, you'd just be blown away by the complex nature of it all and, and you probably would be just overwhelmed like emotionally and, and otherwise and, and you wouldn't know what to do with all the senses. Do you see? But if you're gradually given the examination and experience of the senses, now you're learning something through that process. And also, God's doing it in such a way that is gentle with you, kind to you, where you're not going to get blown away all of a sudden by a whole heap of sensory apparatus that you have no idea how to use. You only are given in the physical body, you are given the sensory apparatus that you need to know about now. Does that make sense? Mm. And then once you learn that and you start engaging the sensory apparatus of your spirit body, now you become ready for the spirit world. As, and the more you engage the sensory apparatus of your spirit body, now you'd be better off in the spirit world rather than on earth because there's more senses that are developed there. Does that make sense? Now these are all senses of the soul. But we have to have them attenuated, otherwise we'd be totally blown away and overwhelmed by the whole thing that we wouldn't even cope emotionally with the experience. Does that make sense to you? Mm. So this is one of the main reasons why God created this three-stage system. is so that there's a part of the senses given to you, then another part of the senses given to you, and so forth, until you actually... And by the way, the half of the soul can't exist without these bodies, without the other half connected. So there's a whole heap of sensory apparatus that can't be developed unless you meet your soulmate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Have you, have you ever thought about that? No. Most people never consider that. But there's a whole part of your soul that can't be developed unless you meet your other half. There's a whole heap of senses that... that, that, that require the amalgamation of the two halves to function. Yeah, pretty good design, hey? That's what I'm saying, the soul, she's a clever design. It just amazes me, the design in the soul. Uh, Lorleen? Let's just get rid of that too. Lorleen, um, my question is pertaining to the will um, it, does that mean our will is the real emotional self? And if we have it and our soulmate, do Can they have? You, I feel we're getting ahead of each ourselves now. You're asking a whole heap of questions that we haven't haven't talked about the two other selves yet. So let's let's go through them all, and you'll have a number of questions, right? So let's just look at this first. This is something that most of us aren't aware of. My real self lacks development. Right? The reason why is that others created damage or hurt to my real self at a very young age, conceptions onwards. And that means that my real self has become desensitised. Like, so it lacks development. It, it's locked up at certain ages. It's, unfortunately, that's the way it is. So you know how a lot of people say, you connect to your soul and you automatically know everything and all that kind of crap? Well, it's all crap, right? Because, because our real self has been damaged and because it's damaged, we need to undamage it in order to know things. and We need to go through a developmental process. Now, you imagine if there was no damage and we were allowed to develop without damage, you imagine the amazing impact that would have on the development of our real self. Instead of us being 40 or 50 or 60 and saying, oh, I've got no idea who I am, we'd know exactly who we are and exactly where we're heading because we'd develop qualities, right? But because of, dam of, of other things occurring, damage occurring, the real self lacks development. It's like the real self is still a little unborn baby that we've yet to really even connect to for most of us. Uh, that's a fact. Others attempted to force me into a facade to suit them 
at a young age which further damaged my real self. So from conception onwards, others created a facade. And they attempted to force me into that facade. From conception onwards. I continued to damage and hurt myself through my choices and the use of my will. So now I'm also adding to the damage through the choices I'm making, the unloving choices that I make. I continued to develop the facade. So the facade was started off by somebody else, but I chose to accept it, and then I chose to continue its development. And this is what many of you have done with your facade. Your facade was created by mum and dad, what they wanted, what they wanted you to be, all those kind of things, and then you chose to accept it. You didn't know you had a different choice, right, at the time, so you chose to accept it, and then you chose to further develop your facade. And for many of you, you've developed your facade like seven, you had a facade, 12, you had another facade. When you were 17, you had another facade. You met your first girl and you fell in love and you created another facade. And then when you had children, you created another facade and so on. And some, some of you have got like 20 facades, one for each job. You know, when I'm work, there's my facade. When I'm at school, when I'm t learning something, there's my facade. When I'm actually, you know, engaging with my, my partner, there's another facade. When I have my children with me, there's another facade. You know, we're so confused, we have so many facades. It's no wonder we're confused, eh? Consequently, my real self remains undeveloped, untrained, and remains a potential. Is that sad, eh? That that's what's happened to our real self. It's undeveloped. It's like a child, a baby still, the real self, because it hasn't been developed. It was left behind in our development. On, in many aspects. Now, our sensory apparatus physically haven't been left behind, so that part was developed. Right? But there's other parts of us completely undeveloped. Like, if I go back and we talk about, um, sorry, if I go back to, to be, like, are you automatically honest, candid, truthful, frank, candid, blunt, transparent right now? Are you automatically that in every situation? So, so, so some, that's not developed, right? It's a quality that was there, present, right? That, that could have been developed, but instead it's been suppressed, denied. By the time you were two, most of the time, that was denied. You started expressing yourself and you got belted around a bit, and when you get pain, what did you learn through your sensory apparatus? I can't express myself without getting pain. So you stopped. Right? So there it was, suppressed. That's a sad thing. Let's go back. Okay, so we can call my real self my unknown potential self at this point, right? Most of us don't have any idea what it is. That's the sad thing, isn't it? You imagine growing up in a world where by 10 years of age you had a good idea who you were. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. But unfortunately it's not the case. So that's our real self. There's still a lot to learn, right, about that. But this is the funny thing about infinite truth. It's not that funny when you think about it. It's pretty logical. But the more you truth you receive, the more questions you feel like you need to ask. Yeah. yeah this is pretty good, eh? So don't stop asking questions. But don't expect yourself to know everything by asking a question. You're going to have to experience your real self to know the answers to most of your questions. Yep. Okay, so what's my hurt self? Second part. What's my hurt self? Created by other people harming me from conception onwards. Is injured further by my harming myself or others through my choices. So I got injured. And then I chose to injure myself further by my choices. It's stagnant at the age the damage or harm was created. Every little bit of harm that you couldn't feel during your developmental years is now locked up inside of you at the age that the harm was created. 
So let's say at three years of age, you were belted by dad because he, you just annoyed him too much. And then when you started crying and screaming because of the violence and your fear, he said, I'll belt you again unless you shut up. And so you shut up and try to suppress it all. In that moment, there was harm created at three years of age and that three years of age emotion is going to need to be felt whether you're 60, 70, 80, 90, 2000, whatever, you're going to have to feel it. And when you feel it, you'll feel like you were three because it's a locked up emotion stagnant at that age. Does everyone get that? Contains most of my inner causal emotional pain and suffering. Right? And we can call it my hurt child if you want to sort of connect to it better. But remember, it's not just childlike emotions because there are a heap of adult emotions that we, where we took actions that caused this hurt to ourselves. And in fact, the majority of the hurt caused to ourselves has been caused by ourselves, which is sad. That shows you how much we don't love ourselves. Okay, is there any questions about that? Yeah, Vera? Do you just want to know because you don't want to experience your hurt? I don't know. Let's have a go. <laughs> Does that mean that in order to get to the hurt child, mm -hmm. you need to feel what you've done to yourself and other people first? Well, we haven't done the third self yet. So what, say we go to the third self and then we'll be able to look at how we deconstruct this whole thing. How about that? Because yeah, my next talk that I'm going to give to you is about deconstruction, the deconstruction process. Anto, thanks. Anto, um, so is all our causal emotions that's in our soul just in this area of the soul, in this fragment? Well, remember, it's not fragment. It's multiple fragments, if you think about it, because each one is stagnant at the age that the hurt was created. So for the average person, there's hundreds of fragments in this area of our soul. Does that make sense? And, and it just depends on how, you know, what happened during our childhood in particular, but also the choices we made thereafter as to how many fragments. And there's fragments at 40, 50, 60, you know, 25, 30, 33. There's fragments at every age. You will feel the age of the fragment when you feel the emotion. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Pauline? Lolene, I touched on some, I think, childhood shame. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know whether it was an adult shame or a childhood shame or whether it was at all. Well, my suggestion there, we'll talk to you about feeling emotions later. My suggestion is if you're not sure, then, then there's still work to do. Okay. But we'll talk about the deconstruction process after this, after we cover the basics. Is that all right? Okay, so my hurt emotional self, how does it feel? It feels pained, hurt, aggrieved, wounded, injured, upset and distressed. You connect to some of those feelings? Yeah. It's timid, nervous, shy, fearful, hesitant, apprehensive, cautious and concerned. That's how it feels. Right. It's fragmented, disjointed, uneven, suppressed, dormant, undeveloped, concealed and embryonic in its nature. It's been humiliated. It's one of the jets going by. It's humiliated, shamed, embarrassed, disgraced, unfavoured and self-conscious. It's rejected, discarded, unwanted, and unneeded, often by yourself and others. It's angry, rebellious, self-absorbed, self-centred and lacks awareness of its surroundings. 
So these are some of the emotions associated. I think that noise goes through, so I better stop that noise. <laughs> I'm rubbing my beard with my pen, and I can hear myself in the. It's angry, rebellious, self-absorbed, self-centered, and lacks awareness of surroundings. So can you connect to that part of yourself? Uh -huh. Okay. Now let's look at its development. Each hurt is frozen at the age that the hurt occurred. So let's say you were two, mum or dad smacked you, hurt occurred if they suppressed the hurt, because it's only if the hurt isn't fully experienced. You see, if the hurt was fully experienced, it won't be there. It's only when it's not fully experienced that it will be that it's been suppressed, and if it's been suppressed, it's now frozen at that age. Right? This is the problem with this hurt. It feels quite confusing going through it because you feel all sorts of ages. Now, this also occurs if you hurt yourself as an adult, the age of that hurt, the law of compensation acting upon your soul with that hurt, will be at that age. It will be less confronting because you're used to being an adult now, so it's usually less confronting. But, but often it's more powerful because the hurt you did to others has a far more powerful effect negatively on your soul than the hurt that others did to you. Okay. Each hurt, while it remains, prevents God's truth from entering on the same subject as the hurt. So in other words, let's say at age two, um, my parents smacked me and I learnt, and they said, I don't... And let's say they were a part of a religious family and they said, I'm going to discipline you now you, because I love you and then they belted you. Uh -huh. And then they also said that if you cry, I'll give you another one. So not only did they hurt you, they also said, they also suppressed your experience of the hurt. Now, at that moment, you learnt a number of things about love. And we can't really call it love, can we? We'd have to call it violence and abuse and parents claiming to love and all those kind of things. But we, because we, hurt, we learnt it at that age, from that age onwards, we will not be able to accept the truth from God about the same thing. So that's sad, isn't it? Each one of these hurts has that locked up, has the prevent, it prevents the truth from being absorbed. All right, if we come to Max. <clears throat> if that happened, but you didn't get the, and if you cry, I'll belt you, would it still be frozen? If, if you were allowed to fully cry, yeah. then no, it wouldn't be frozen. Right? But it's very rare for a person who inflicts violence on a child to then allow the child to fully express its full feelings about that violence. It's a very rare thing. The fact that the person has been violent in the first place to the child is an indication that they are already desensitized to the child's emotions and therefore already in a desire to suppress them. So it's a very unlikely event to occur. Even the emotional imperative coming from the parent will determine the suppression. So, so even if the parent go, looks at you bad, you know, or, or feels angry towards you after that, you'll go, you know, or I've got to correct myself, and you'll suppress something in the process, yeah. So it's actually far more insidious than just a verbal statement or something like that, yeah. So it can just be a look or a gesture or something to Could be, like, yeah. you know, shut up. Yeah, or just even a feeling in the adult. Like every time a baby cries, you feel your feelings. For most people, their feelings are, whoa. Oh, I want that baby out of my... Or can't somebody quieten that baby down? All those feelings are going towards that child. And depending on the emotional injury of the adult who brought that child up, some of those feelings will be absorbed by that child. So the child will start to learn through the projection of these emotions of what it's not allowed to do, what it's allowed to do, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty insidious process, unfortunately. If we go back to... Shirley? <coughs> Thanks. AJ, if, if the negative emotion um, that's displayed is constant in your childhood, it doesn't, 
It doesn't have a range. It's just a constant, say, anger at you. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about that if an experience is negative and it's not experienced by me, it's, it's frozen. There'll be a time where that began, and in this case, usually it's conception. And then there'd be times where it was expressed, generally, uh, that it, you know, where you have heightened expression of it. Yeah. But, and those times will create their own injuries upon the soul. But then there'll be this underlying pervading feeling that also mm. exists inside mm. of the soul, in the hurt. And that pervading feeling will be just a constant feeling that won't necessarily have an age attached to it because there's no longer any... Like, it happened all your life. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm. And so, yes, there'll be a mixture of those kind of feelings. But let's not get too involved in these questions, shall we? If we go, Pam, one more question up the back there, and then we'll keep looking at this development. Hi, Ajay's Pam. So if we can go to the original hurt at the moment. Just hold it a bit closer, Pam. If we go to that original moment of hurt. Yes and process that emotion, can we erase it then completely? Of course. Yeah. yeah. So it's but, finding the origin. Yes, but for the problem, the problem is for most of us is we've got whole layers of facade around that original emotion. Uh -huh. So this is where most of us are struggling because we, we are unwilling to undo the facade. We want to go to the hurt first and we've got to talk about the facade. Okay. So let's keep going on the discussion okay. so we understand the three parts. Each hurt while it remains prevents my ability to feel and experience love as an emotion. Right? So each hurt creates a layer of suppression on the feeling of love. So in other words, we've become more and more desensitized to what love really is. That's the unfortunate result. Each hurt while it remains defines my understanding of truth and love. In other words, I start believing things are true that are actually completely false. And I start believing things are loving that are actually completely unloving. So, for example, in the previous example that I gave, a, per a person brought up by a parent that says, I'm loving you while I'm smacking you, is going to, in the end, feel that smacking somebody is an expression of love. That's pretty sad, isn't it? But that's what they finish up believing. If I can continue, Alan. Each hurt is locked up inside and cannot be released without sincere expression. And the operational word being sincere... <laughs> Each, unless the hurt is felt emotionally, the hurt self cannot grow emotionally. Consequently, my hurt self remains young, childish, immature, contained and restricted. So, you know some of the fears that you have? Some of them were created at such young age that you now, even as an adult, have no idea why you get so afraid about some things. Like, case in point, when you see a snake or a spider or a mouse, or whatever it is that makes you afraid, right? Like, it's totally unreasonable to the adult mind as to why we were getting afraid from these creatures. But something happened in our childhood, locked up at an age, that causes us to be young, childish, immature, contained and restricted about that subject. And that's why we have those kind of emotions. Right? Now, as you can imagine, there's a huge amount of things that can be said about everything I'm discussing here. Remember, this is called, the subject of this talk is understanding self and introduction. <laughs> Just bear that in mind, right? It's an introduction. Okay, let's look at the third self. The third self is created in childhood by other people wanting me to be different to my real self. This begins from conception. So those of you who were conceived and dad wanted a boy, you felt that emotion. That was somebody, your dad, wanting you to be something different to what you finished up being. He wanted a boy, you turned out to be a girl. Or he wanted a girl, you turned out to be a boy. That entered you at the moment of conception. There's already a facade based on that emotion. In other words, there's things that you've done throughout your life to try and get daddy's approval now because you weren't enough for him right? at the time of conception. So this is part of this facade. It's further developed by my purposeful desire to ignore my real and hurt selves. 
So I'm choosing to ignore my real self. Ignore my real self, nobody wants. My hurt self, nobody wants. So I ignore them and I create a facade to deal with all that. Right? It's often very adult in nature since adults or myself as an adult develop the facade. And when I say adult, usually it depends on the way in which we've used our will. So, so what happens for mo most people is that from conception onwards, a facade was created to please the parents. Now, when the per child is born, there's more facade created through the desires of the parents and the desires of the environment. But eventually, the child becomes more cognizant and aware of itself and its own desire for facade. And this very much usually occurs in our teenage years. We start recognizing there's things about us we don't like, there's things about us we do like, we keep the things we do like, we make the facade for the things we don't like, we cover that over. And then we might, you know, we might have traumatic events that occur in our life, we do the same thing. We might have changes in relationships, we do the same thing. So in the end, we end up with lots of different facades. And many of you have a facade for a different purpose. See, see many of you have developed a facade for interacting with Jesus. Did you know that? Since I've known you, I've, known, I've seen a, a facade develop. <laughs> How about that? And you've chosen to develop that facade for some reason. Well, because you're obviously worried of how I might judge you or whatever it is, but you've developed the facade. You, you've even got facades for different type of people. So you've got one facade for dad, one facade for mum, one facade for your kids, one facade for your partner, one facade for your workmates. But most of us have at least ten facades, at least, because we've created all these different facades for different roles. It helps us get through the day with that kind of person or individual, you see. It's pretty sad, eh? We've done a lot of that ourselves. We were taught how to do it by our parents, of course. It contains all of my mechanisms for coping, managing and controlling my life. It has been formulated so that others, firstly, and then I, could avoid the feeling of pain and avoid my real self. Right? So we could call my facade my adult facade just to help us identify with some of these emotions. Now the question then becomes, well, what are the emotions associated with the adult facade? Let's have a look at some of them. It loves addiction, compulsion, obsession, urges, cravings. You reckon, recognize all of those? Yeah? It loves bullying, force, harassment, oppression, repression, coercion, and manipulation. It loves abuse, cruelty, nastiness, meanness, brutality, viciousness, and unkindness. It loves resistance, conflict, confrontation, disagreement, quarrel, squabbling. You recognize that part of yourself? Just uh, got to have an argument, I've got to have an argument. Loves arrogance, condescension, superiority, conceit, disdain, pride, egotism. This is all part of this facade. It's insensitive, unaware, lacks perception or insight. In fact, it's totally clueless in most situations. It, it, it judges some things as loving that completely not. It judges other things that are not loving that, can, that completely are. It judges some things as truthful that are not. And, and it, like it's completely unaware. So it has no insight whatsoever. It's unexpressed, unexpressive or false in its expression. You know? So it's either this kind of numb out, like I'm zoned out, cool, you know, that's my facade. Or, you know, the ones that are flamboyantly over the top, you know, that you know you're not getting the real self. It does that too. That's all facade. Whoops. Let's just go back one. It's unanimated or false in its animation. Lethargic or forced vibrancy. You know? So they're laissez-faire or into forced vibrancy. It's closed, reserved, controlled, forced, guarded, untrusting. Sound familiar part of yourself? Yeah, that bit of it goes scrutiny everything, you know. Always looking for something wrong. That's part of the facade. 
It's dishonest, untruthful, insincere, lacks frankness, opaque and is not candid. Uh, that's a part of you that just wants to lie in some situations because the truth wasn't good enough, right? <laughs> it's prying, interfering, snoopy, nosy, meddling, intrusive, invasive and pushy. It's unemotional or falsely emotional, unfeeling, unwise, dumb, stupid and illogical. These are not judgments, this is a statement of what it is. It's fixed, immovable, predetermined and rigid. You know that one, right? Yeah, I've felt all that from you for the last couple of days. Right? That's you staying in a facade. It's apathetic, lazy, disinterested, uninvolved, bored and unconcerned. It's another side of that coin, isn't it? It's unwise, imprudent, thoughtless, irrational, reckless, irresponsible, careless. It just goes and does what the addiction demands. It doesn't care about the results. It doesn't even care about the results for itself, let alone anybody else. That's what it does. Just rushes headlong into disaster. <laughs> you know? Many of you are worried about making a mistake, right? It's your facade that makes most of them. Yeah. If you gave up your facade, you'd make a lot less mistakes. <laughs> It's selfish, self-absorbed, self-centered, narcissistic and vain. You know, that's the part of you that wants to get on Facebook all day. <laughs> that wants to answer every email, even the ones that are attacking and abusive. It's that one. Now, our facade self, unfortunately, also lacks development. See, gee, we're lacking development in our real self and our hurt self and now our facade. The facade self is a figment of our or someone else's creation and imagination. It was what one, somebody wanted us to be, yeah. right? rather than what we really are. So it's a figment of their imagination or creation. It's denying the real emotion of the hurt and real selves. So you know that bit of you that goes, I want to be spontaneous in you, and you start being spontaneous, and then it's all of a sudden go, oh, oh, if you be spontaneous, that, that bit's the facade that kicks in then. So sometimes you, you're, you're in the stage of actually feeling a bit of your real self and bang, in the facade. Right? These the switch so readily. The facade is managing or controlling the direction of growth and awareness. In fact, the facade doesn't like growth very much. It likes a predetermined outcome every time. Because it's all about managing fears. It's all about managing development. It's all about managing things. Your facade is counter-intuitive, but it's also counter your actual growth. It actually is. It, it does. It wants the opposite. It doesn't want growth. You can't grow unless it's real growth. <laughs> real growth, right? The facade has no interest in true soul-based progression of the real or hurt self. In fact, the facade has been developed to prevent it. Right? The facade is an imitation adult, a baby or a fiction in adult's clothing. Right? This is what most of us are. We, are. we are going around being an imaginary person. Because of this facade that's been created from such a young age, conception onwards. It's uh, been created. It's pretty tricky, eh? So now we have some basic understanding of the three selves, and it's very basic at this point. We've obviously got a lot of stuff to talk about with those three selves. We're not going to get to discuss all of them in this in these in this sessions with you. You know, I've spent two thousand years discovering things about my real self. I can't share them all with you in eight days. But this is what we need to do if we want to progress towards God. We've got to remove the facade self. So we've got to go through some kind of process that allows us to remove the facade self. Does that make sense? We've got to educate, feel and experience the hurt self. Uh, the hurt self ha has development problems. It, it, it thinks certain things are true that are not true anymore. Right? 
So it's going to need education. But it also has to feel what it feels, otherwise all the feelings will stay locked up inside. They won't be released. The way our soul is being created is to release something, we need to feel it. So we're going to need to express it somehow. So it's going to need to do that as well. But it needs this education. And, and by the way, I can't sort of underemphasize this, this thing. Education is a key part of helping your hurt self release the hurt. Because most of you are not educating your hurt selves. You know what you're doing? You're actually telling them that they're right. And that, that's a very dangerous thing to do if you ever want to release your hurt. Because often your hurt is not now right. It, it was right at the time that it happened, but it's not now right. Like for, for example, you're, many of you were hurt in fear, but that fear was created when you were three. You were three when it was happening. You have nothing to fear now, but you still believe you have something to fear because that fear from three was never, has never been released. So when you tell yourself that fear is everything, you've got to honour your fear, you're educating your hurt self down the wrong track. You're reinforcing the false belief that the fear is worth honouring. And it's not. The fear must be felt and released, but your, your hurt child actually has nothing to fear through that process. God's created a beautiful process for you to do that. So this requires your education. Most of you are educating your hurt child in a completely the wrong direction. Then develop, educate, feel and experience the real self's qualities, attributes and personality. Now, at the moment, many of you are worried that the rest of your life is going to be remove the facade, educate and feel and experience the hurt self. But the reality is that, you know, the hurt that you have right in front of you at the moment, I know people from my past that have unimaginable hurt in comparison to yourself and they are completely happy because they've released the facade and the hurt and they've, they've chosen, using their will, to experience and develop their real self and they chose to connect to God through that process and as a result, all of their hurt and all their facade disappeared and honestly, in comparison to yourself, some of these people, like some of them have been tortured for years, like physically tortured for years, you know, and they're, all, they're happy now. And if they can do it, you can do it. All right. So this is what we need to do. And then develop a desire in the real self to receive God's love and truth. That's the only place where you can develop that desire, your facade. Many of you have been trying to have a facade relationship with God. Trust me, it doesn't work. God doesn't have a relationship with your facade. Your facade is something that will disappear. God wants a relationship with your real self. That's the part that needs to develop the desire. Develop a desire in the real self to be loving and truthful with others. That's where that comes from, the desire to love and, and be truthful with others. So let's just go back. So do you get the deconstruction process? Very simple. Very simple explanation. <laughs> Very difficult process. Made difficult because of the facade and the hurt selves. Right? Made difficult because of what we've chosen as a human race to do to each other and ourselves. Okay. The most difficult process is to remove the facade. A lot of you haven't begun. Everything you've done, many of you up to now, has been all in facade. Even all the crying you've done has been in facade. It's the most resistance to love and truth. It wants to retain itself. It wishes to avoid all painful emotion. It's angry and resentful towards God. You add up all that, and you can say, oh, our facade wants to keep itself. This is the battle you're going to have with your facade. Once you get beyond that, the experiencing the hurt and educating the hurt is far easier. Far easier. And it's actually quite an enjoyable process. Even educating and feeling the hurt is quite an enjoyable process in comparison to removing the facade. The facade is your most difficult challenge. 
It's the hardest thing you're ever going to do in your life. If you want a relationship with God, this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done in your whole life. Removing the facade. Linda. Um, Linda, I'm just feeling that this is where spirit influence really takes over, isn't it? Because of our resistance to feeling our facade self, that is what allows the spirits to attack us or control us. And it's our willingness to go beyond this that will help to break that connection that we have. Yes. But we have to look at the addiction that we have to, to that spirit attachment as well in that process, don't we? Yes, but uh, bear in mind too that a lot of your addiction to spirits is driven by the hurt you feel that you don't want to feel. Okay. And it's also driven by this feeling of trying to avoid the hurt, okay. right? So, so the facade has to examine its reasons for avoiding the hurt. Okay. Thank you. Because that's what's causing a lot of these spirit-based interactions that are harmful. Okay. Mm. Thanks. Thanks, mm. Lani. Um, when you say the hurt self, we need to release the hurt and then educate the hurt self. How yes. do you go about that? Well, you have to educate it before you'll do any release. That's the fact. See, the hurt self has hurt in it where it believes itself to be right for holding on to the hurt. Mm. And somehow you're going to have to educate it through the process of desiring to release the hurt rather than holding on to it. And that's going to require education. So the education process has to begin before you release, not afterwards. Once you've released the hurt, you won't need the education anymore because now you'll be open to truth. Does that make sense? The education is going to have to begin before then. So, for example, let's look at the aspect of fear. For most of you, you believe completely that you should not have to feel it. That's your hurt self expressing itself. It doesn't want to feel your fear. Right? The fear that's locked up inside of it. It doesn't want to feel it now. The facade is all created to avoid it. But once you deconstruct the facade, you're going to have the hurt still feeling like it wants to avoid its fear. You're going to have to re-educate it so that it's safe to feel its fear, that it's able to feel its fear, that God created it to feel its fear, that everything will be all right through the process of feeling its fear and all those things before you'll feel the fear. Does that make sense? Thank you, no answer. Yeah. Thank you. Jane, thanks. Sorry, Bay. Thanks, Mary. Jane, if I'm living in my fear, am I living in my facade or I'm living in the hurt self? Well, it's a mixture of things that you're doing, right? So you, you've got to be with this. Um, you've got to understand that it's not so cut and dried as what you want to make it be. See, a lot of you want very clearly defined rules with all of the deconstruction process, but the reality is that there can be no de predefined rules because each of you are individual in the way in which your facade and hurts have been created. And often the facade and hurt have been created concurrently. In other words, a hurt was created and very shortly thereafter a facade. Right? Created at different ages. So, so this is the problem that we face, is that quite often we'll get into the facade, feel through our facade, and then we'll get quickly into the hurt associated with that particular facade and feel some of the hurt associated with that part of, the, of ourselves and get through all of that. We have to educate it to go through the process. But then there'll be other things that we haven't even touched yet that are still part of the facade. Does that make sense? So, so it's going to be a bit-by-bit bit process because of the emotions involved and the emotions are all very much intertwined with each other. The hurt and the facade-based emotions are very much interlocked and you're going to have to first deconstruct the facade on the emotion and then you will get into the hurt about the emotion. Does that make sense? So with Okay, so, so they're sort of like the blocks or the layers we've put on top of that hurt emotion that we have to work through. Yes, it's not like whole of your soul can be dealt with in three layers. It's not like this. So imagine, imagine this, uh, this is not what I'm saying, okay? So here's the facade, here's the hurt, 
and he's the real self, right? It's not like that for the whole of your soul because, because you can't just... What you do when you're dealing with different things is you rub out only a little of the facade on a certain subject and that now exposes this hurt to you on that subject. And once the hurt is exposed on that subject and released, you can educate it through the process of release and it's released. Once the hurt, there's this, now there's this opening if you like, so you could think of it now like this. Now I have access to my real self on that subject. Does that make sense? Yes. But it's only on that subject. All the other subjects remain untouched. Yeah, Does so it's this sense? huge like this huge like a puzzle of yeah, it's just getting slowly into the different Correct. bits, yeah. Correct. Yep. yep. And by the way, most of your work is not going to be on your facade or your hurt in the long run. Because most of your work's going to be developing your real self. That, that'll go on for, forever, infinitely. Right? This process of deconstruction of facade and hurt is only a process that we have to engage because we have a facade and because we've cre had, had hurt created. Now, most of you see those two things as everything. This is part of your problem. You see dealing with those two things, the hurt and the facade, as everything. Right? This is a big part of your problem. It's nothing in comparison to the development of your real self. Your real self-development is going to go on infinitely. The deconstruction of your facade and hurt can only take a few years in comparison. You know, even if it takes you 50 years, it's nothing in comparison with forever, right? So, so this is our, we even have conceptual problems with how our, we're made up. We go, oh, there's just a mountain of hurt inside of me and a mountain of facade inside of me. It's never going to end. Well, that, that statement in itself is untruthful and a part of the construction of your facade. Because what's the following statement that we usually make? Because there's so much in me, I might as well give up now. I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it, right? Just, I might yeah. as well give up. There's your facade saying, don't do it. You might as well give up now. It's never going to work. Right? And what's God's truth? God's truth is... Yes, it will work. Other people have done it before you. You have the capacity to do it. God's saying, I designed your soul to do it. So what's God's truth? See, see you need to even educate your facade about what God's truth is all about. So that's why we sort of need to feel like what you guys were talking about yesterday, develop that faith, like sort of develop the faith in God, those feelings that God can assist us in the process. So Correct. Once this is we why faith is such an important quality. Those sort of emotions break down to that, then we can start being more real about ourselves, what our facade is, and then Correct. go more into our hurt. Yeah. See, at the God. moment, yep. most of you are listening to your hurt and your facade. So you're not re-educating it. You're going, you're going, I want to believe them, right? And if you, if you choose to believe them, you're not going to get anywhere. Right? That's why many of us are stagnant. We're not getting anywhere because we choose to believe them. But, but can you understand the principle too of what I've just explained? It's like creating an opening, creating an opening. Now we have access to our soul in that area. Yep. Can we stop the child from bashing the... Thanks. That would be great. Yep. Ask again, Jane, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry, babe. It's all right. Sorry, thanks, Jane. Um, so for every single sort of hurt that we've had in our life through childhood, so it's just that one opening each time. So we're gonna just be doing this each. Yeah. Each, and yeah. and ov and obviously you'll be rubbing out bits and pieces at different places, right? Yep. So you, sometimes you'll get rid of facade there, 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 but not get to your hurt yet. Yeah, but not completely. I feel, I feel like I had this false belief that the facade, I can get rid of it, like I've had to get rid of that first, totally. Yeah. And then now my hurt's exposed. No, you won't and get now, rid of it totally yeah, on every subject because it's been created to protect your hurt and you've got to deconstruct the reasons why you've created it to protect your hurt. And that's my lack of understanding. So this yeah. is a lot more clearer. Yeah. Now. So yeah. it's going to have to be a piecemeal process. But you're going to, you'll get to a point where actually you're more connected with your hurt than you are with your facade. And so you, so that'll I'm feel not... like a major shift inside of you. You go, wow, I'm being real like 99% of the time now. Uh, before it was like 
5% of the time I was real and the rest of the time I was all in different facades. Now I'm real all the time and it's really good. You, you'll really enjoy that place. No matter how much hurt you feel, you really like being there. And it'll be more easier to come out too. Like I won't have as much of that fear. Correct. That, yeah. You're going to have to deconstruct your facade on all these different subjects, right? And you'll find the more you focus on doing that, of course what's happening to my circle, my barriers now, right? What's happening is disappearing. So what's happening? I'm now getting more access to my hurt. I'm now starting to feel the results of my hurt on those things. And you can see as I start rubbing away more and more of my facade, what's happening? What's now the dominant part of myself that's being experienced? My hurt self. My hurt yeah. now is the dominant part. So you get to a point where sort of the equilibrium balances, tips over from oh, focusing facade every time to now all the time, pretty much 90% of the time, you're always getting to your hurt straight away because your facade has been deconstructed in those areas. Does that make sense? Wow, that would be amazing. Yeah. Once you do that, obviously, then now all of your hurt gets uh, exposed. Do you follow? So now the facade has completely disappeared, or almost completely disappeared, and now there's hurt everywhere <laughs> to feel. And you'll actually, ironically, you'll probably enjoy that process. It's a lot easier process than deconstructing the facade. And there won't be, as, there won't be that resistance either, will there be? Oh, no, 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 oh, remember, still? remember. Yeah. Yeah, yes, go back, go back towards the hurt self. What did we say? If we go, oh, yeah, I've got some other layers on my that hurt self feels rejected, discarded, is angry, rebellious, self-absorbed, self-centered. Yeah, okay. yeah. there's going to be some of those emotions in there. Okay, so it's more digging. <laughs> you, you know, you've got to be careful how far you take this uh, discussion because you, you, you'll find yourself wanting to put it all in boxes and you'll need to go back to this introductory material frequently over the coming months if you really want to understand yourself. Thank you. Um, okay, well, I've been talking for a long time. Uh, what is the time? Quarter past? 20 past three. 20 past three. And we've still got deconstruction of the facade and experiencing the hurt self to go today. Impossible. Impossible. It is impossible for us to do that today. So we're going to have to decide what we're going to do. Do you want to have a conference? You want to have a conference? Let's have a conference. You don't mind us having a conference in front of you, do you? No, that'd be good. Let's do that. Okay. That's good. So that gives me another 10 or 15 minutes to answer any of your questions that you have about this subject. And, uh, and tomorrow we will talk to you about deconstructing the facade and also experiencing the hurt, child, hurt self or hurt child. So we'll talk about those subjects tomorrow with you. So, Ella, if we come down... Sorry, Mary's had to put something away there. I actually have very little love uh, towards my child. You're very... I sorry. don't love him a no. lot. No. And uh, I... You mean your, your, your physical child? Yes, my son. Yes, yes. Um, and I actually virtually never tell him that I love him. Does it make any difference if I tell him lies that I've never felt like doing? Or not saying anything at all? He already knows. But would it, I mean, would it, because my parents told me that they loved me while they were not, did yeah, it make no any difference either, uh, whether you tell lies or you don't? Does it hurt him well, less or more? No, it hurts you more. So, so let's look at lo what love would do, shall we? So, and maybe this is something we should keep for another time because it's a bit digression from the subject. But if we really loved, right, there would be, well, there's, you could say there's scales of what's loving, isn't there? So what is it, what's worse, not loving someone and lying about it or just not loving them? See, I would say not loving them and then also lying is actually a darker condition. And then not loving in itself is a dark condition. What would be the better thing to do? <laughs> to actually love, right? That would be the best choice. And you know a lot of your questions, not just yours, I'm talking group-wise, you're trying to make a decision between one of these two things. 
but you're completely ignoring the real thing. Do you, do you understand what I mean by that? Like you're saying, is it better for me to do this or is it better for me to do that? You've given me two unloving options. One's better than the other, but they're still unloving. The third option is to love him. And to do that, you're going to have to release some of your feelings towards men because that's how you're going to love him. So it's, imper it's like very important you put that as a high priority so that you can love him. Does that make sense? That would be the choice that a person who loves would make. This, choosing between these two things, is an excuse. Basically, what you, what you, if you're not careful, you're going to say, well, at least lying about it is worse, so I'm just not going to lie about it, and I'm just going to say, no, I don't love him. That's, that's, not, that's better than lying about it, but it's not what is loving to do. The loving thing to do is to love him and to work on all the reasons why you don't. Does that make sense? That's the loving thing to do. You've, you and many others, like when I say you collectively, I'm saying, and many others who have heard divine truth continually put these two choices in front of me. What is the least loving? What is the more loving? I'm not interested in what is least or more loving. I'm interested in what is loving, <laughs> like absolutely loving, perfectly loving, that's all I'm interested in telling you. Do you follow me? And I don't believe any other thing is actually worth discussing. It's all driven by a, a choice to not do the thing we need to choose, which is to be loving. To actually be loving. So just be careful of this re kind of reasoning. It's false reasoning. It, it's the kind of reasoning that says it's okay for me to be do something that's that's a bit more loving than where I was before, but it's still not really loving. And it's okay. And you're saying to yourself it's okay, and it's not. It's still unloving. Right? It's still a sin. Remember, everything that's out of harmony with love is sin. Sin equals everything outside of love. Everything that's unloving is a sin. This is still unloving, so it's still a sin. It's just not as sinful as doing that. That's all. It's not as bad a sin as that, you know. Going down further, we could go further, couldn't we? We could, we could uh, attack him, punish him, you know, be violent towards him. That would be even further unloving, wouldn't it? Right? And then, you know, we could murder him. That, that would be even more unloving, wouldn't it? Right? But honestly, do, can you not see they're all just degrees of unloving? Isn't it better to find out what is perfectly loving and do that? And whatever is in your soul that prevents you from doing that, find that and get rid of it. So that, so that you can do what is perfectly loving every time. Isn't that the way to go? Yeah. So stop trying to make choices between what is more or less unloving. Just start choosing to love every time. Any other questions? <coughs> I'm going back to understanding self and the uh, facade, hurt and real. Yep. Um, does the God's laws operate in that sphere? Does this, yeah, like the law of attraction operate when you're trying to deconstruct or? Of course. Okay. The law of attraction is really, uh, all of God's laws are so perfect in their operation that anything that we sincerely, so, so it should, maybe should say that again, sincerely wish to address, the law of attraction will demonstrate to us what it is. The problem for most of us is that we're not sincere, and so, we, of course, when we don't have a sincere desire to address something, then, then everything's going to look to be quite undefined and ill-defined to us. You have to have a sincere desire to really get into things. Everything is based on sincerity. Now, this is going to be hard, isn't it, for the facade? Because what is the facade all about? It's about insincerity. The facade is, by nature, insincere. So, so learning to be sincere about our facade is going to be a difficult process by definition. 
because the facade itself has been created in order for us to maintain insincerity. Yeah. So this is why it becomes the hardest thing to deconstruct. To sincerely deconstruct the facade requires us developing the quality of sincerity, ethical behaviour, honesty and quite a number of other things which the facade itself doesn't want us to have. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's the problem, is that that's why the facade is going to be your hardest task. Because it, it by nature, it, is uh, adverse to actually deconstructing itself. Mm. So that's going to be an issue, isn't it? That's why it's the hardest thing. Yeah. Let's go around. Jamila. Uh, so, so maybe I need, uh, want a manual, but... but to help me to understand. So yep. when, for me, it's the first I feel, that's the feeling of hurt or fear or something. And then <clears throat> to, in some way, go up to my head and, and connect what it is about in the history. To, to, to yeah, no, help. None of the, none of the, firstly, none of this is an intellectual process. So let's go back. Let's go back. Because uh, remember, the real self, remember I listed the emotions. That's all emotional stuff, isn't it? Okay, let's go down to the hurt self. Isn't all that emotions? That's all emotions, isn't it? Yeah. And when I go down to the facade self, isn't all that emotions? Yeah, it is. It's all emotion. Can you see that actually all parts of ourselves are emotional? Right? Now, when you use your intellect, you're in denial of emotion. You're not actually feeling emotion. Your intellect, God gave you the intellect as a tool. Many of us use it very unwisely. You know, it's like, it's like God giving you a knife and you use it to stab somebody with it. <laughs> right? Well, God gave you your intellect and you used it and many others around you helped you use it to suppress your emotions. Well, your intellect needs to be used in a different direction. Your internet, intellect needs to be used to help you access emotion, to access the true feelings of the soul. Your facade, this is part of your facade, the emotions of the facade, is emotional. It drives your thoughts. It drives what you choose to do. It drives your, the, the things you act upon. Just like your hurt, remember if we go back to our hurt, our hurt is emotional, right? It's those, it's those emotions, right? That's how it hurt. It's emotional. It also drives your thoughts, because remember, these are, not, these are just fragments of oneself. So it, it drives your thoughts. It drives your actions. It drives your desires. And then, of course, you've also got your real self, which is also emotional, and it also drives your thoughts and feelings and desires. So, this is where most of you are going to get stuck, right? You're going to try to do a whole heap of theories about what I've now just taught you, rather than just listening to what I've taught you. And you're going to try to use your intellect to deconstruct things, and you can't. You're going to need to access it emotionally. The facade has emotions you have to feel. The hurt has emotions you have to feel. And the real self has emotions you need to let yourself feel and develop. Right? They're all emotions you're going to have to feel and develop, educate. Right? Now, when you say, how do I use my intellect? How you use your intellect is to always go back to finding what you feel. And what you feel is about sitting with the feeling. So. Mary and Corny tomorrow, or now it's going to be the next day, will help you with addictions. They will help you to identify the feelings of the addictions. Does that make sense to you? Not the thoughts, the feelings. They will help you identify what it feels like inside of yourself when you go towards an addiction, and what it feels like when you don't get it met, and what it feels like when you do get it met. That's all a part of your facade. Your addictions are all part of your facade, generally. Right? But there's a heap of feelings you're going to have to process. 
This is the reason why most of you are struggling with progressing because you're not allowing yourself to feel the feelings. You're trying to use your intellect to find feelings and your intellect does a terrible job at it. I've told you that so many times I can't even remember how many times I've told you that. Your intellect doesn't know how to deal with emotion. Your intellect is responding to emotion but it doesn't know how to find emotion and deal with emotion. You need to use your intellect in such a way that allows you to access the emotion. Many of you have been using your intellect to deny your emotion altogether. That's not very helpful. Right? But you need to use your intellect a different way to that. But your intellect is not going to be the key to this process. Feeling and releasing the emotion is the key to the process. Right? The people who feel and actually release the real emotions, they are the ones who get there. Now, many of you have been trying to also do this. You go, ah, oh, yes, uh, I'm going to completely ignore that I have a facade. Uh, facade? What facade? Right? So what we do is we do this. We don't even put a name to that layer anymore. Right? It's like, that doesn't exist in our own mind. And then we go, ah, oh, yes, I do admit that I'm hurt, but I would much rather develop my real self. Right? That's the part of myself that has all of the nice bits in it, right? So that's where I'd like to go. So you know what we do? We don't even create these openings anymore. So these, this is how it is normally before we begin. We've got, still got the facade and we've still got the hurt, right? But we're going, no, don't do that. What we do instead is we go straight to the real self and we engage its desires and we engage its passions and we do all the real self work. Uh, can you see some, some problems with that? How do you even know what is real when you've got a layer of facade wrapped around the thing? You see, and this is what many of you are trying to do. You're going, oh, I know my real self feels like going here. No, your real self doesn't. You don't even know what your real self is like. That's why I call it your unknown potential self. Because you've got no idea what your real self really wants at this stage. Until you deconstruct your facade and you get into your hurt, you're not going to know anything much about your real self. That's reality. But so many of you don't want to go that. You don't want to even admit there's a facade and you don't want to even go to the hurt. So what you try to do is you try to get to what's real in yourself and develop that. Huh? Well, good luck with that. In 25 years' time, I'll come and talk to you about how unsuccessful you've been, uh, if you want to do that. But that's what many of you have been doing for five years that I've known you. Uh, so, so I say give all that up too. You need to give that up. Remember, your facade is purposely constructed to deny your real self and your hurt selves. So therefore... Your facade on any issue is going to prevent your intellectual analysis being accurate on every single subject on which you're hurt or that is your real self. And unless you deconstruct your facade, you're stuffed. And most of you haven't wanted to do that. You know what I find ironic though? Mary has been demonstrating to you in her day-to-day -day life for the last five years how to do that. And most of you have completely ignored and actually judged her through the process of doing it. And yet you've had a perfect example right in front of you, Mary, doing it. And you've ignored everything she's told you about that process. Now I do, got rid of a lot of my facade years before I met you, so you haven't had the joy of seeing me disconstruct mine, right? <laughs> but you have had an example right in front of you. But you don't want to do it, see? What we want to do is we want to skip all of that. You know what most people want to do? They want to skip the facade completely. So this is the facade. Most people want to skip the facade completely. They want to... What's the word? Self-pity over all of the hurt, which is actually part of your facade. Right? And they want to say, I'm developing my real self. When they've got no idea what their real self actually is. 
and can never hope to have an idea of what their real self actually is unless they get through some of the facade and some of the hurt. Now, there are parts of your real self that may be completely undamaged and may not have a facade, but there won't be many of them. Right? There will only be the parts that your parents or your environment all the way through your life agreed to. That makes sense, doesn't it? Anything that your environment agreed to being inside of you is acceptable and therefore probably is not damaged. So give you an idea of where you, some of the places where you're not damaged with regard to your soul. Some of the places are things like related to your sensory parts of, your, of yourself. A lot of them are not damaged. Right? So your eyesight works are okay because nobody did anything that would affect your eyesight to you and your damage. See, with me it was different. For those of you with glasses, it's different. There was things done to you during your childhood and everything that caused damage there. But for other people, there's no damage there. Right? So all of us can feel some sensations in our bodies, right? But the majority of you are totally desensitized to most of your body. Why is that? Because we had a lot of pain and childhood suffering often, particularly with regard to violence, so we desensitize ourselves to that. And so that means now we desensitize ourselves to touch. But taste, man, you guys are so sensitive to taste when it comes to sugars and carbohydrates. Right? But when it comes to proteins and things that are not so sugary, you're a bit less sensitive to those things, the nuances of those tastes. And one of the things we've tried to do this week is give you a bit of sensitivity to that. When it comes to water, dehydration, right? most of you are completely desensitized to the fact you're walking around dehydrated all the time. But when you go to the toilet and you urine out bright yellow or usually brownish yellow, right? that's an indication that not only are you dehydrated, but there's also toxins coming out of your body that are struggling to come out. right? But, but you're not sensitive to that. So there's whole areas even of your physical body, your spirit body and your soul that you're sensitive to or not sensitive to depending upon the damage that was created and depending upon the facade that was created. So some of you have injuries I don't have, and some of you have no injuries that, like some of the injuries I have, you have none of them. And that's what it's like. Because all of us had a different experience, right? That's what it's going to be like. But the real process that we need to go through is deconstructing the facade and the hurt. We're going to have to go through that process, honestly. You're going to have to stop thinking that you can just jump to your real self and develop that because you're not going to be able to do that. There's cer certain parts of your real self that may be undamaged and you'll definitely be able to jump to those and develop those. But the majority of it's going to be covered with something. Hmm. Any other questions? And going back to the facade, yep. obviously um, spirits and that that are with us are heavily invested in our facades. Oh, yeah. And our hurt. Heritage, the whole lot. Yeah, yeah. It was just huge investments in our facade and our hurt. So even harder to get them off. Well, right. yeah, part of this process is, see, once getting rid of spirit influence is quite easy, actually. But it requires a lot of sin sincerity, and this is where we have trouble. Our facade, remember, is insincere. Mm. So, so this is where we have a lot of trouble. Spirits influence us a lot there because we're insincere. But once we start getting to here, we're often quite sincere. And as we become more sincere, we have a lot less spirit influence in that place. But remember, though, we've got to educate ourselves. Because sometimes the spirits will tell us things that are totally in agreement with our hurt. So if our hurt's saying, don't need to feel any fear, and the spirits are saying, you don't need to feel any fear, where do you think you're going to go? You're not going to feel fear. You're going to need to re-educate yourself and go, hang a sec, those spirits are wrong, I'm wrong, I need to feel my fear because I'm never going to get to my real self unless I feel my fear. Right? So there has to be a re-education process still. Thanks. Yep. Okay. 
How are we feeling? Is that giving you a lot to ponder? Yeah? yeah? Okay, that's good, huh? Hey, imagine if this was taught when you were five. It's like, Mummy and Daddy did this damage to you. You've created a little facade there. You know, don't worry. A couple of hours and you'll be done with that. <laughs> and, you know, imagine that. And now that we're 40, 50, 60, 70, whatever we are, you know, it's going to be like, oh, here we go. <laughs> you know, a laborious process, right? And it is a laborious process because the longer we've lived, the more we've created, unfortunately, out of harmony with love inside of ourselves. Right? Rather than judging all of that, we need to just get started on the process. You know, the more you complain about that's the way it's been, Does complaining about it get you anywhere? Like, have you found complaining about it gets you anywhere? I haven't. Nobody listens to you anyway, generally. But even those that do, you know, they all complain too and then we all get all upset and all complain, but nothing changes because we're all still not getting into the real thing. So complaining about it doesn't help you. You can yell and swear at God about it being like this, but it's not God's fault. So even that's not going to be truthful. That's your facade having a big scream at someone else that's not to blame, right? Uh, it's not God's fault that you have a facade and it's not God's fault that you have hurt. God created a perfect system and it was man's choice. Your parents' choice, your choice and other people's choices that caused you to have the hurt and the facade. Yeah. So, you know, we can't blame God for the fact that they exist. They are the results of people's choices out of harmony with love. If, if everyone was in their real self and chose to love... There'd be no hurt, no facade. You know, we, we wouldn't even be bothering with this discussion. We'd, we'd instead you know, have a much more encouraging discussion, which we have usually in the six or seven spheres of the spirit world. And you know what those discussions are about? Developing your real self. Yeah. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Just to have no discussion about facade, no discussion about damage, no discussion about addictions, no discussion about all the damaged emotions that you're going to have to feel and the pain and suffering you're going to have to go through and all that. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah, but not possible. Not in the world we're living in now. You, you have an option to create a different type of world by you choosing to lead this process of actually going through this process on earth. You have that option, but you don't have an option by faking it because that's just another facade. So we, we have this option, which is a wonderful option. But what I love about the spirit world, once you've actually released your facade and hurt, is that every discussion is just like fascinating. Right? And, it's, and it's all based around development, growth, all these really positive things, right? You don't see much of that on earth, right? Yep. Or you see people you know, who, who are good speakers giving all this G up to people and all this energy out and everything else, and, uh, but they're not being realistic. Uh, it's not being truthful. The reality is we've got a lot of crap in us and we need to deal with it. And that's going to take some time. And I'm not going to lie to you about that. It's taken me some time. It's going to take you some time. I'm a pretty dedicated person. It's taken me, uh, I'm now in my 11th year of sincere effort. Right. So it's going to take you some time. But you get to the stage where you start feeling you're hurt more and it's more, you're happier, you feel more joy, and all those things. Sherry? Um, so have you uh, no facade now? No, of course I have one. You do? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And if I didn't have a facade right now, most of you probably wouldn't even be able to sit in the audience. Wow. My facade is still focused on pulling myself down. Yeah, okay. To prevent me from feeling and experiencing certain fears associated with being Jesus. And being on the earth? Uh, not so much being on the earth, just... Just being Jesus. Yeah, just, just who I am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Mary yeah. still has facade as Of well. course, Corny yeah. has one, yeah. 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 The difference between myself, though, and yourself 
is that, is that I don't have a facade on very many areas of my life. Yeah. So I still have a facade in certain areas, yeah. but not on a lot of areas of my life. Yeah. And I don't have a different way that I act with you than I act with anybody else, even Mary. So I don't have that. But I do not act in complete harmony with my real self. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Do, you're in connection with your real self, though. Sorry? You're, you are in connection with your real self. You know yeah, I'd yourself. say probably 5% at this point. Wow. Maybe 5%. You know, that, that's, that, well, the thing is, you, see, you haven't, you don't, you've never met me in my full development, have you? No, no. So, so the spirits who I know who have met me in my full development would probably assess me, oh, they might assess me as, I'm just hearing some people say, maybe I need to say about 10%. Right, yeah. that's what it's <laughs> anyway, you know, my assessment is usually lower than most people's because I just, I, like, I'm very conscious of what I need to do still. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 It's not a self-attacking thing. It's just no. I'm just conscious of what I need to do still. Now, some of the emotions I'm now facing will have a have a huge impact on my happiness and welfare. Does that make sense? I'm right down at the core emotions now yeah. uh, for myself. They're quite difficult to release because they're quite powerful and strong, and uh, much more powerful than anything you guys will ever have to experience. So unless you come back to a world from the 36th sphere in a, and the world has to be in the current state that it's in. I, I, I'm never coming back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and most people, don't have, you don't have to. So, so unless you chose to do that, you wouldn't have anywhere near the emotions I've got to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's what all of the 14 are having to go through that process, right? And have you remembered... Have you been aware of all of this amazing knowledge for a long time? Or has it mm. come back as you've grown in, in this life? No, no, like a lot of what I'm teaching you today, I was aware of 10 years ago. And is that um, so for Mary? Sorry, I just want to ask um, you. Probably a lot of what Mary's aware of today is probably more come to her the last year. Is that probably yeah, more okay. accurate? Yeah. You need to just switch on your mic if you're going to... Uh, I believe that the memories, like all of the 14 have a soul... Oh, sorry. sorry. All 14 have a soul memory of everything that's being taught, but it does require us connecting to at least our hurt self in order to be able to channel that. You see... Because the facade is totally engaged in bullshit, really. You know, it's not... It's trying to keep us away from our soul. The facade of the 14 is like there to keep us away from our real self. So it's the same facade as what we have? No, uh, I wouldn't say it's the same. It's the same. As, uh, they're more extreme. Yep. All the yeah. 14 have a more extreme facade than you have. The reason why is because they have to exercise a more extreme facade in order to stay away from themselves. Yeah. So all of them have a much more extreme facade than any of you. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. We knew that that would be the case before we came. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we knew we'd have to go through a deconstruction process. Most of the 14 are complaining about that process now. <laughs> but we knew. Yeah. You see, it's a, it's a bit of a different process for us. Yeah. Because our real self retains its development. We, we've, you know the, the parts, remember in this part here at the beginning when I talked about your real self, so, here where it says you can develop to become these things. Well, we've already developed those things. Mm. Does that make sense? So yes. we're a bit different to the average person who's on the planet in their first incarnation because in your first incarnation you have to learn to develop those things. Yeah. Whereas the 14 have those qualities developed, they've just got a huge facade and a huge amount of hurt over the top of it, suppressing it. Does that make sense? Once they release the facade and the hurt, all of the things they've developed shine. Yeah. And so yeah. what you see in me is like 5 to 10% of my real self shining. That's all you see. Yeah. Yeah, I hope in a year or two's time there'll be more than that. Yeah. 
But, but as I said, I'm going through some very big emotions now, which have a large impact on, they've had a large impact on my entire life and a large impact on my worth. So as I go through those emotions, there should be quite strong development occur as long as I go through those emotions. And I have to choose to. It's not a given. It's not like God saying, oh, you're going to do that this date and this date and this date. Just like for you, it's not that. It's your choice and it has to be my choice to do that. If I choose to ignore it, two years' time, I won't be any better than I am now. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 That's the way it works. And a person who's one of the 14 can choose as much, and, and actually we've got a more developed will than the average person on the planet. So when we choose to ignore something, <laughs> we really choose to ignore something. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we use all the means possible, usually, yeah. to ignore it. Yeah. But then when we choose to access it, we also know how to do that, because that's already a developed quality in our soul. Yeah. So, so don't confuse the reincarnation. See, see, if I was speaking to a whole heap of spirits about reincarnation, you could see I could have a completely different, I could have a completely different discussion about the selves. Hey, okay? yeah, yeah, because it's a completely different discussion. Yeah. So don't don't try to apply things that are that don't pertain to your own development to another person's development who don't doesn't have the same situation. Yeah. yeah. No, it's good. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Good. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? What is the time? I just got to keep an eye on it. Four. So yeah, this is the last question. Far away. Is it alright if I ask a question about you two again? Sure. Or, yeah. So I'm just curious. When you guys are in the sleep state, are you guys operating as a whole soul, or are you still a spirit? Like. Yeah, now you're starting to get really complicated <laughs> okay. in terms of uh, a question because there's a very, it's a, I can answer the question, but it's going to take me a good 15, 20 minutes to answer okay. it. Yes, that's uh, fair enough. In order to, mm. for you to be satisfied <laughs> with the answer. <laughs> um, and even then you possibly won't be satisfied with the answer. Um, so maybe we need to leave that question yeah. for an informal cool. time or something right. like that. Yeah, yeah, no worries. But, but there is a fairly logical answers to those questions mm -hmm. um, that we can talk about with you at another time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And what we're trying to illustrate to you here is that it's your development, not ours, that we're trying to help you with. We already know how to do it. We've done it once before. All right? In Mary's case, Cornelia's case, they've done it once before. All right? You guys, this is your first time doing it. So first time, need a bit of help on the way, generally. All right? Now, if you're in the spirit world and you were sincere, you'd be getting that help. On earth, there is a very much a big shortage of help to, to understand, and that's what we're trying to achieve by what we're doing, giving you the assistance that you need to get your way through these processes that are essential parts of your development, if you want a relationship with God. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay, well, let's have some dinner, shall we? Thanks for your time today, guys. <laughs>